So I'm gonna kinda chop this topic up into three segments. Firstly, a few of the settings of the camera, why they're important and what they do. Second, the different modes of shooting. And third, a few fundamental creative rules of photography that are gonna make it much easier for you to get a beautiful image, regardless if you're a beginner or even an advanced photographer. And if you watch to the end of the video, then I'm extremely confident that you're gonna walk away as a better photographer and you're gonna be much more familiar with your camera and its capabilities. So let's start with the settings. There's three main things that you're gonna have to become familiar with and eventually master. So the first one that we're gonna deal with is called ISO. And all that is, is a setting that determines how sensitive your sensor is to the light that's available. And your ISO is one of the three settings that affect your exposure. If you set it too high, your image is gonna be overexposed. That means your highlights are gonna be blown out. And if you set it too low, that means your image is gonna be underexposed, which means that your image is gonna be too dark. So moving along, the next thing that we wanna focus on is our aperture. Slight pun intended. Did you catch it? The next thing we wanna focus on is our aperture. And our aperture is simply the hole in the lens that allows light to pass through and hit the sensor. And how wide that aperture can open on your lens is represented by a number called your f-stop. And you'll see that number written on your lens. It'll say like f2, f4, f5.6, etc. Now the closer that number is to zero, the wider your aperture can open up. And the wider that it opens up, the more light it can let in to hit your sensor. So lenses that have a good aperture are referred to as fast lenses, which are lenses that have an aperture of f2.8 or better. And fast lenses are generally more expensive than other lenses because they're gonna do better in low light and they're gonna give you the ability to get out of focus backgrounds, also known as bokeh. And I'm gonna detail for you how the aperture affects the blurry background in the next section where we'll discuss your shooting modes. And I'll also let you know a few of my favorite fast lenses for the M50 and the M6 Mark II that can give you that highly sought after blurry background. But for now, let's move on to the last setting we need to discuss, which is the shutter speed. Speed. And to understand shutter speed, we have to visualize the sensor in the camera. So let's say that the sensor is right here. Well, in front of the sensor you have a shutter. And now when you hit that button to take a photo or to start recording a video, that shutter opens up. Now, the longer that that shutter stays open, the more light is gonna hit your sensor. So if you set the shutter speed to 1 50th of a second, it's gonna let in a certain amount of light. But now let's say you set it as something faster, like 1 500th of a second, then that's gonna allow a lot less light. So those are the main three settings that affect your exposure. And all three of them together are referred to as your exposure triangle. ISO, aperture, shutter speed. Now if everything we covered so far still hasn't quite sunken in and it's still a little bit confusing, don't even worry about it. Because for one thing, you can always go back, rewind the video, listen to it a few times, take some notes. And two, the Canon M50 already comes with automatic shooting modes, which we're gonna discuss next. And those automatic shooting modes will pretty much handle everything for you. But it's extremely important that you understand what's going on under the hood and that you're eventually able to use manual mode where you can control all those three factors yourself. The reason being is because those automatic modes are dumb. Now I don't mean that they're no good or you shouldn't use them or anything like that. What I mean is that when you use them, the camera can't determine what type of scene you're looking at. So it's gonna kinda make its best guess as to what those settings should be. But in many cases, the various automatic modes do pretty well. So let's go ahead and get into those so you can see what each mode does and how to use them. But before we do, I need you to do a few things for me. First, smash that like button if you liked the video so far. Second, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. And third, hit that little bell icon so that you're notified every time I put out a new video. I appreciate that. So let's get into these hieroglyphics on this mode dial right here. The first one that we're gonna start with is the one called Creative Filters. It's the little symbol with the two circles that are overlapping each other. And all you really need to know about this mode is that you should never use it. Why? Because it's just a bunch of filters that it's gonna add to your photo that you're not gonna be able to remove after the fact. So let's say you're in a scenario where there's like a once in a lifetime opportunity to get an amazing photo. You go and take the photo and you got some crazy looking filter on there. The thing is that you're never going to be able to go back and remove that filter from the image. But on the other hand, if you take your photo and edit it in Lightroom or another software like that, you can add any filter that you want without destroying the photo. So instead of using these in-camera filters that are going to be burnt into your image, what I would recommend is that you go to my website, fulancreative.com, and you purchase my Lightroom profile pack, which are 11 creative filters that are gonna make your images look amazing. And it's only 15 bucks. 
bucks. And I know that was a shameless plug, but I'm serious. Don't ruin your images by using this creative filters mode. All right, so if we move up to the next setting on the dial, it's the one that says SCN. And what that stands for is special scene mode. So what it does, if you touch the corner of the screen over there, it allows you to choose from various scenes, things like portrait, landscape, sports, etc. I think it also has a beauty mode or something like that where it's gonna make you look all fake and plastic. So I would stay away from most of these as they're mostly gimmicks, but I could potentially see where the sports one may come in handy if you're shooting a fast moving subject like high action sports, race cars, or your kids or something like that. So anyway, that's your special scene mode. Now if we move that dial one more notch, what we have is an A with like a little film strip next to it. And what that is is just your automatic photo mode, but it also allows you to have control over your frames per second if you wanna shoot video. Next we have the mode where it says A+, and this is your fully automatic photo mode. So when you put your camera in this mode, it's pretty much a point and shoot. And if we move one more notch up, we got this little P over there. And what this is supposed to be is like training wheels or a stepping stone into manual mode. So this is pretty much just determining all the settings for you as well, except that it's allowing you to choose your ISO and it also lets you control something called the exposure compensation where you can make the image lighter or darker without having to play around with the shutter speed and aperture. And in my opinion, this is pretty much a useless mode as well. But now we're gonna get into the last three modes and these are the modes that you really need to concern yourself with. So let's start with TV shutter priority. So this is where it starts to get interesting because what this mode does, it allows you to choose the shutter speed, then you could put the ISO on auto, and it's automatically gonna set the aperture for you. And it's gonna attempt to constantly give you the proper exposure. And so you may be wondering, what's the point of locking in the shutter speed on one setting and not allowing it to fluctuate? And the reason you wanna do that is because the shutter speed not only affects your exposure, but it also affects the amount of motion blur that you're gonna have in your image. And when would you want motion blur in your image? Well, have you ever seen those beautiful photos of waterfalls where everything looks nice and crisp, all the trees are real sharp and beautiful, but the water and the waterfall looks like it has this beautiful flowing mist on top of it? The reason it looks like that is because they set the camera on a tripod to where there's zero movement in anything except for the water. And they set the shutter speed extremely low so that you get nice motion blur and anything that's moving in that shot. That's why you see the trees and the landscape and everything else nice and sharp, and you see that water with all that extreme motion blur to where it looks so beautiful. Another example is when you see those light trail shots of streets and skylines that look real cool. And what's happening there is the same thing. They're setting the camera down on a tripod so that there's zero movement. They're taking a photo with extremely low shutter speed, and all the streets and the buildings are coming in nice and sharp because there's no movement, and the cars and everything like that are leaving that beautiful light show behind them because they're moving. Now it's very important that if you try this type of photography that you have the camera set on a tripod because if there's any camera shake at all, even if it's just a little bit, it's not gonna work when you're trying to do this slow shutter style photography. And I'll put links in the description of this video for a good tripod and other studio gear that I found valuable. So I hope that's starting to paint a picture for you about the creative possibilities with playing around with your shutter speed. So we discussed when you would wanna use a slow shutter speed, but now what about a fast shutter speed? Something than like one over 250, or one over 300, one over 500, etc. Obviously, the shutter is opening and closing real quick now, so we're gonna get less light onto the sensor, so to be able to keep our exposure proper, we're gonna have to raise either our ISO or our aperture. But aside from giving you less light, it's also now giving you less motion blur. And this is used mainly when you wanna get a photo of a fast moving subject. Let's take, for example, a high action sport like boxing. Have you ever seen a photo when somebody's getting punched in the face and you can see the impact perfectly, nice and sharp, even to the point where you can see the individual beads of sweat flying off of his face. Or let's say maybe like a basketball player right in the middle of a dunk where the shot is so nice that it almost looks like he's posing midair for the photo. The reason they were able to get that image like that is because they had the camera set at a high shutter speed. If they would have left it normal, like at 1 1 25th of a second or less than that, then there would be motion blur in the shot. And instead of producing a photograph where you have a shot of that athlete right at the perfect moment, nice and crisp, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a blurry image instead that's leaving a lot of motion trail. Now, if you do wanna attempt this type of photography, I'll give you a tip. What you wanna do is you wanna put your camera in burst mode where you could just hold down the shutter and it lets off like 10 shots in a row because if not, it's gonna be hard to get that perfect shot if you're just trying to do it click one photo at a time. So let's say you let off like 100 photos, then later you can go through them and just throw away the ones that you don't want and keep that one or two that are that perfect shot. And next, we have our 
AV, Aperture Priority Mode. So this is just like shutter priority, but the difference being that instead of setting the shutter, you're setting your aperture. So it's gonna lock in the aperture of your choice, and what it'll do is automatically adjust the ISO and the shutter speed for you, but it'll keep the aperture constant. And just like shutter speed affects two things, which are your exposure and your motion blur, the aperture also controls two things. It affects your exposure and your depth of field. And depth of field is just a fancy term, meaning how much space is in focus. So a shallow depth of field would be like if the focus plane, let's say, is on my eyes. So my eyes are nice and sharp, but the background is way out of focus and the foreground is out of focus. And to get shallow depth of field, also known as bokeh, you need a lens with a fast aperture. And in my opinion, f2.8 and f2 are right about the sweet spot. And anything more shallow than that, such as f1.8 or f1.4, etc., it's gonna be a little excessive. And what you're gonna find, for example, is like somebody's nose will be in focus, but then their eye will be out of focus. Or their eye is in focus, and their ear is way out of focus because the depth of field is too shallow. But I have to admit, depending on the subject, sometimes you can shoot at f1.4 and it's beautiful because the background just melts away nice and beautifully with that kind of aperture. And in my opinion, the top two lenses for the M50, M50 Mark II, and M6 Mark II that can give you that kind of shallow depth of field are the Sigma 18 to 35 EF lens and the 32 millimeter F1.4 EFM lens. They're roughly around the same price, but if I had to choose one, personally I'd go with the Sigma. And I'll leave a link in the description for both of these lenses, along with the adapter that you're gonna need to be able to use these EFS lenses and EF lenses on your M50. So to recap, to get nice bokeh, you need a lens that has a good aperture, which brings us to our last and most important mode. And that's the one with the M right there, which stands for manual. And this one is pretty much self-explanatory. It's where you get to choose what your aperture is gonna be, what your shutter speed is gonna be, and what your ISO is gonna be. And I would most definitely encourage you to try your best to shoot in this mode most of the time so that you could quickly improve. But to do so, you gotta learn about just one or two more minor settings that I haven't discussed yet. And the first one being your white balance. Canon already has some preset modes which are extremely useful. You have one where it shows some clouds and it's pretty self-explanatory. You wanna put the camera in this mode when you're outside shooting on a cloudy day. And if you take a look, there's another one right here which is sunlight. And this is for when you're shooting in an environment where it's nice and sunny. There's another one that you can see that has the sun and a house in it. And what this is for is when it's a sunny day, but you're shooting in the shade. And you can even put it on auto. That way you're allowing the camera to make the decision for you. And for the most part, from what I've seen, it seems to do all right. And the last thing, and thankfully, one of the most simple things on Canon cameras that you're gonna have to get familiar with is the various auto focusing modes. And really, they're pretty straightforward. All you gotta do is just play around with them and then you'll start to understand what they do. There's really no need for a detailed explanation. So I'll give you a brief one. Basically, you have zone autofocus, where it's just gonna focus on like a square area in the center of the frame, and you can move that around. So anything that falls within that area, it's gonna be what the camera is gonna focus on. Then there's another one where it's a small box, like a point, and you can move that point around, and wherever that point is, is where the camera is gonna focus. And then you have face tracking and eye tracking autofocus, which is extremely useful. And when you choose that, you have two choices. You have one shot and servo. So for the most part, you wanna just leave it on servo. And what that means is that as you move around in the frame, it's just gonna basically follow your face and keep you in focus. And now that we're familiar with all the settings of this little beast and its various modes, what they do and how to use them, now we could talk about our composition, which for me is one of the most enjoyable parts of photography. I you don't have to worry about any settings or numbers or anything like that. And it's pretty much just an artistic choice as to what you wanna capture within these four borders we call a frame. There's a few creative guidelines we could follow that are gonna give us a good framework to base our decisions off. Of. The first one is called the rule of thirds and what you're going to do, you're going to take your frame and you're going to imagine or overlay four lines on top of it. You're going to put one over here, one over here, and that's going to split the frame up into three segments. Boom, boom, boom. Then you're going to draw two more lines, one over here and one over here. And that's gonna give you another three segments. Boom, boom, boom. And what you wanna do is you wanna keep the important things in your photo either on those lines or 
where those lines intersect. Now keep in mind, these are just guidelines to play with. They're not set in stone or anything like that. They're rules that you wanna know and be familiar with, but they're also rules that many times you wanna break. So moving along, there's something else you're gonna see a lot. It's called the golden ratio. And the idea is to place important things in your photo to correspond with this spiral that you see in this Fibonacci sequence. But what I found is that when you play around with the rule of thirds, such as placing your subject on one of those lines, Placing, it, placing the eye level where those lines intersect. When you do that, many times, the photo automatically already correlates with the golden ratio. And the next two factors of composition that are extremely important is simply your foreground and your background. What you wanna do is have your subject and focus, but have some interesting things in the background as well to give it depth. You can also put things in the foreground to make the frame interesting as well. Let's take this fake Ikea cactus over here, for example. I'm gonna put it up close to the lens to where it's in the foreground, so let's imagine that that was just sitting there in front of the camera or something like that. So basically this is giving the photo depth because you can see me on the focus and then you got this out of focus foreground and the out of focus background. So it just makes the image more pleasing. And anytime possible, experiment with different angles of taking shots. You don't always have to be at eye level. Sometimes you may wanna get down on one knee and kinda of point the camera up or kinda of point the camera down and get unique perspectives that people don't normally see. I also like to shoot through things such as fences or keyholes, etc. as this could take a normal normally boring image and give it some automatic intrigue and mystique. Now once you got all that stuff down and you're out there in the field getting amazing photos, keep in mind that there are certain accessories and products that you could get that are gonna extremely level up your photography and cinematography. And to find out what those are, I would highly recommend that you watch this video right here where I tell you the seven must-have accessories that you need for your Canon F50 and F50 Mark II. And I left links down below to all the lenses and the gear and everything that I talked about in this video. It's your boy Fulan. Peace.